Hello, everyone. Welcome. My name is Cassidy Diamond. I am the Associate Director of Public Programs and Events here at the IDA. Thank you for joining us for this conversation of Showtime's Attica, moderated by Indy Wires and Thompson. Before we get started, um, I would like to offer a brief land acknowledgement. I'm coming to you today from Chicago, which is on the unceded land of the Potawatomi people who have been stewards of this land for generations. I would also like to thank uh, IndieWire for their support in bringing the series to you all this year. And as we get to the end of our series, you can look back on previous conversations uh, on our website at documentary.org slash screening dash series. You'd think I'd have that done by now. <laughs> um, you can go there and check out all of our previous recordings. And without any further ado, I'm gonna hand things over to Ann Thompson to get things started. Welcome everybody. Uh, this is uh, a conversation about Attica. It's an extraordinary movie and I have with me the producer Tracy Curry and the director Stanley Nelson. Welcome everybody. Um, so this movie blew my mind as I'm sure it has everyone who's seen it um, and I want to dig into how you pulled this off. Um, I wondered if uh, you tracked the Attica riots at the time, at, at, at the, at the, at, 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 were you aware of them when they were happening? Um, presumably Stanley more than <laughs> Tracy, who looks a little yeah. younger than yeah. we are. Uh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll answer that question first because I was the only one that was alive. Uh, Adam. <laughs> 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 Lisa, if she tracked it, it would have been a, a, an amazing feat. Uh, I mean, I, I remember it, you know, I was 20 years old. And so I, I remember it, you know, I, I mean, I probably remember it like like most people, you know. I I, I remember that, that it happened and that it was on the news, and that then all of a sudden, you know, it was oh wait they 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 went in shooting and and killed all these people, um, but I I never knew kind of the the exact reasons why the prisoners rebelled or the the details of of, of what happened. I just knew the general outline. So what made you go back in? It was something that, 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 that I had thought about for a long time. I mean, you know, like 20 or 30 years, I had thought about uh, Attica and making a film. I think part of it is that, is that I knew that, that the story really hadn't uh, been adequately explained, that <clears throat> there, was, there were witnesses. You know, I figured that there, if there were a thousand people in the yard, prisoners in the yard, you know, during the rebellion, that some of them, many of them would probably be alive and that there were people that to talk to, um, but that they were getting older and, and that the window was closing on, on getting the firsthand accounts of, of what happened. <clears throat> and I, I also knew that, that there was um, some footage, you know, that existed um, that I had seen. Um, I had no idea the amount of footage that that existed that we would find. Okay, so tell me about that. Where, where, who was shooting that footage? How did it exist? How did it get saved? Where did you find it? Uh, oh, Tracy, you want to answer that? Yeah. Hey, okay, sure. Um, so um, part of what made uh, the uprising at Attica um, so extraordinary, because there had been other prison uprisings, even in New York prior to that, was that um, the prisoners kind of had the temerity to demand that the media be allowed into DR to record everything that was happening. And I think it was the first time that the public had really been allowed to hear um, and see the experience of people um, who are in prison in their own words. So um, going into it, we knew that that had happened. And so um, we understood that there were networks that had gone in and um, recorded film of all of this. And so um, the first thing to do is to kind of figure out who those networks were, um, uh, contact them. We had an extraordinary, um, very tenacious archival producer, Rosemary West Hundy, um, and just go to all of those network archives and just begin digging and asking um, and seeing what it is that they have. And so many of them um, still had a lot of this extraordinary footage that you see in the film. Um, and then from there, it was just a matter of asking 
continuing to ask those questions. Um, anybody that was even tangentially related to this, what they might have. Um, Stuart Dan, who you see in the film, is one of the reporters that were there. He had his own personal archive of um, materials as well. And so um, Stanley likes to say that we have to get everything, everything, everything. So it really was a matter of going and then going back again and again and again and digging through every possible archive that had any piece um, of footage. And then for some of the photos that you see, um, a lot of those images um, were part of the evidence. Um, there had been decades of lawsuits um, following the events of September 13th, 1971, and included um, in a lot of those evidence files were some of the photos, um, and in particular, what you see of the aftermath of the retaking on the 13th. And so we were able to access some of those as well. And how did you do the tracking down of the surviving prisoners? Yeah, so um, <clears throat> one of the things that was very helpful um, as far as the prisoners are concerned was that um, when the settlement, which you sort of see in the, the coda to the film, um, happened in the year 2000, um, the judge from, um, I believe is the Western District in New York, um, his name is Michael Celesta, he did this extraordinary thing where he allowed every single surviving prisoner, and this is 30 years later in 2000, to either come into his courtroom in person or to call in on the phone um, and have as much time as each of them wanted to speak about the experience of what happened to them on the 13th and the aftermath, the trauma that they all kind of live with, physical, emotional, mental, and otherwise. Um, and there's a record of that. Um, it's hundreds of pages long. And um, I you know, went through all of that. And again, that was in 2000, so that was 20 years ago. Um, but just sort of tried to get a sense of um, how old people were then, who might still be around, who seemed to have a really compelling story to tell. There were some people that very clearly were just too traumatized to speak, but there were others that had a lot to say about it. Um, and then it was a matter of kind of compiling a list and sort of going through public records and really just getting on the phone with people um, and beginning to have some of those conversations, which you know, certainly uh, a lot of folks <laughs> were not excited about the prospect of revisiting, um, you know, a profound trauma of their lives with a total stranger over the phone. Um, but there were, fortunately for us, enough of them who were really gracious enough and courageous enough to um, share that with me. And that's what you end up seeing in the film. So did you do those interviews with them? Yes. Yeah. There were some great characters there. So Stanley, you had to you had to sort of decide who the characters were that you wanted to to follow. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you know again, Trace, Tracy uh, did did all all of the interviews, and, and you know, just an in, incredible job. I mean, you know, one thing that 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 we should frame this whole thing by as we talk is that the whole film was produced in the time of COVID. You know. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we were scheduled to to start shooting in April, and COVID broke out in March, and so the whole thing was done in the time time uh, of COVID. But um, uh, you know, the the interviews were, were just you know amazing. Um, but I'll let Tracy talk about it because she did it. Tracy, yeah. uh, how did you pull that off in the pandemic? Yeah, I mean, um, I think in some ways, just the the this work is all about kind of creative problem solving. Um, and so in some ways, the pandemic was just a really big problem <laughs> to, to solve. Um, uh, you know, obviously, the safety of everybody from the crew to, you know, all of the people that we interviewed was paramount um, for all of us. Um, and then there was sort of this extra added um, <clears throat> concern that pretty much everyone in the film, because this happened 50 years ago, is in an age category where they're particularly vulnerable, right, um, to COVID. So that was a concern. Um, so it, for starters, it was really just kind of letting people know that if they did not feel comfortable for any reason, didn't need to give us an explanation that like, we are not pressuring you to come and do these shoots because we certainly understood. Um, and fortunately, pretty much everybody um, still agreed to do the film. And so from there, it was just a question of kind of um, just on the safety part, following the public health guidelines, doing what we could to make everybody safe, masking, distancing, um, shooting maybe one person in a location where in other circumstances we might've done two or three, finding large locations, kind of doing all of those things, sanitizing every single piece of equipment, every surface. Um, and then on the production side, um, at a certain point, it just sort of became untenable for us to um, do shoots in person because we, we still kind of didn't know with travel if that was okay. Um, and so we had to start thinking about doing remote interviews. 
students. And so ultimately what ended up happening was for people that we kind of couldn't get to because they weren't um, in New York or in proximity, we figured out a way to do um, remote shoots. Um, and so I think one of the things that I'm proudest about about the film is that I don't think you can tell the difference in the film between when I was literally physically in the room with someone and when I was talking to them the way I'm talking to you right now through through Zoom. Um, so yeah, it was a big it was a big production problem to solve, but I think we we we, we succeeded in, in figuring it out. Yeah, I just want want to add when, when when Tracy talks about remote shoots, she means that that you know she was remote, but but I think you know we always had a camera person in the room in the room with them. Um, but, but, you know, we said, okay, you know, we can try to limit it to one person because we wanted the film to, to, to look like something that, that was shot, you know, pre COVID. We didn't want it to, to be, you know, uh, to be filmed off the zoom camera or something like that. So, and, and, and I, I think the interviews, you know, they, they just look incredible and, and the people are, are just great and, and, and it completely uh, relaxed and, they're actual, you know, they're actually characters. You know, you get uh, different personalities out of different people. You see who they are in the film, and and, and they're not just you know ex convicts or ex prisoners, but they're they're human beings, and and that really comes through um, through the interviews. Well, I think I mean part of the strength of the film is that we all have a a, a relatively superficial memory, most of us, I think, of what actually happened, and to have that. Um, archival footage and that testimony from the people who experienced it is quite shocking. I forgot, um, and, and obviously what you're revealing um, that is all too timely in, in our Black Lives Matter age is, is, is how racist everyone really was back then. Um, it's, ex it's extraordinary uh, so some of the footage of, of the cops outside the prison uh, after the the I never knew that 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 level of um, torture and outrage and Guantanamo Bay uh, tactics was was deployed. Uh, I had no idea that 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 went on uh, afterwards. Yeah. I mean, I think one of the most shocking things uh, uh, about the film is, is what went on after after the shooting stopped, you know, and, and people come to us, you know, at, at screenings, you know, all the time and talk about what happened after the shooting started, stopped. And, and, you know, if you were around or you knew anything about Attica, you know that people were killed, you know, but but you don't know that that then after the people were killed, the torture started. And that, that, that there's no other way to describe it except that the prisoners were tortured. And, and the amazing thing about it is that the, the people in the film were subjected to that torture. You know, they're not talking about something that they, that they heard. That's heard what's about. horrifying, yeah. Uh, that they, that, 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 that they were, that, you know, they had to endure. And, and the, the other, the observers and, and even the National Guard talk about it you know one of the national guard is, is you know his eyes are red because he's been crying and he talks about the fact that you know that the torture was happening but he had no power to stop it because there's there's 500 armed men uh torturing the, the prisoners after the people were killed where did that footage come from and had that footage ever been shown before um, I, th I think that the black and white footage was, was the New York State surveillance um, tapes, and I think that you know Tracy can talk about about it more. But but what <clears throat> some of it you know had had been seen. I think that that some of the shooting you know had, had been seen in other films. But you know when they sent it to us, they sent us like a few hours of of of, of, of tape, and it was really a jumble. So stuff would be repeated, and then stuff would cut off, and then then you'd be looking at it, and you'd realize, oh, wait, I saw that already. And so it really took a matter of of just you know going through it over and over again, and trying and and, and finding different and new stuff. Um, and also, it, it illustrates so often what the the prisoners were talking about being done to them, right? So I, I think one of the things that, little things as a filmmaker that I'm proud of is, is the first day you see them building the latrines, digging latrines, you know, in, in the yard. Uh, you see them digging the latrines. And then at the end, 
there's there's uh, just you know uh, one horrific shot of them being made to crawl through the feces and and the and the latrines, you know, and and but but what I'm proud of is because is we don't have to tell you, you know, because you've seen them digging the latrines, and you know that they're not just crawling through a ditch, right? You know what they're crawling through, and I, I think that you know those kind of things uh, are, are are illustrated in the film. No, you did a great job of of building the tension, right? Because because if, for those of us who don't remember exactly how it played out, um, there's a lot at stake. And I was fascinated too with the media, the the role that the media played. And I remember uh, Johnson from that period because uh, I lived in New York and he was a, a local newscaster. <laughs> so it was great to, to see that familiar face and then see the older man r looking back on it. Talk about him a little bit. Yeah, I'll talk first because I, I can remember him, you know, but, but you know, John Johnson, you know, it was a big deal I mean, in New York, you know, if you're in New York, you know, he was one of the first recognizable, you know, African American reporters, and you know, he had an afro and you know, he was always dressed, you know, and it was, you know, John Johnson with the news. And, and so <laughs> you know, he, he was like a big, uh, a huge deal. And, and um, you know, uh, as you see in the film, you know, he sent up to Attica, um, and, and uh, you know, he was reporting kind of on the spot from Attica. And, and, you know, he's just incredible in the film because he's not only a news guy who's there, but he's also, you know, obviously still deeply affected by what he saw in Attica. And, 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 and he <clears throat> kind of reflects the emotions that, that go through the film from the first day where, where everybody inside, including the reporters and, and, and the, the observer committee, believes that, that they're gonna negotiate this to a piece and they're gonna, and they're actually gonna gain something, you know, for prisoners' rights across the country to its devastating end. Um, but Tracy, you know, you you were the one who, who actually did the interview with John. Yeah, I mean, I don't think that there's more to say than what you have and what we see on screen. I mean, he's just so dynamic. I think one of the things that's so interesting to me about John is that um, he was one of the few reporters who did not report um, on the 13th that the prisoners had killed the hostages. Um, and he has spoken about this, that he actually suffered professional repercussions um, as a result of that. And sort of because he did not report about it in this dispassionate way, um, there were consequences for him um, for that. And I think one of the, the interesting narratives that kind of emerges from the film about the media is that the media is both the gift and the curse um, in this story, because um, on the one hand, had those cameras not come in, had the media not reported um, what happened, we wouldn't be sitting here today. We wouldn't be talking about this 50 years later. Um, there would be probably no record of you know the government having killed 39 of its own um, citizens. We would not have this film without that footage. But on the other hand, this is also a story of the media's um, failure of media malpractice. I mean, the the the, the they assumed practice. that the prisoners did something that they didn't do. Well, not only did they they assume, but I think some of it gets to the perils of access journalism that we talk about today, because you had one voice who was a spokesperson for the prison. That person came out and said the prisoners slashed all these throats and killed all these people. And the media just ran with that story and reported it. And that became the dominant narrative about what happened on the 13th. The prisoners killed all of these hostages. And even the next day when the medical examiner reveals that that was all a lie and that all of those people died of gunshot wounds because of the primacy effect, the first story was the one that was most resonant with people. So to this day, there are people that still believe that the prisoners killed those hostages, even though they retracted the story the next day. And that was a failing on the part of the media in that instance. So it also felt like the media was inflaming the community outside to, to get to the place where they did, to get, oh, yes. to, 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 mean, get to the anger and the pent yeah. up rage. Yeah, I mean, those reports about torture of the hostages, all of that stuff got reported in the media that the prisoners were castrating the hostages, that someone had been pushed from a from a balcony, um, when in fact, we know that the prisoners made sure the hostages were fed, gave them blankets so that they would stay warm, organized a security force for any prisoners who might be wanting to do them harm, they were protected from that. So it was actually the, the opposite of what happened. 
Um, and, you know, in some ways, I mean, we can sort of Monday morning quarterback and speculate it, but the, the, the anger of the police force that had gathered outside of the prison to some extent was fueled by these reports from what, about what was happening inside that were in the media. Um, and obviously, you know, people are responsible for their actions, but part of what the observers were saying when they were asking the governor to come was please come and see and feel the anger of this, this armed force that you have brought outside the prison that we see. Because if you see what we see, then you will know what's gonna happen when you send all of these people in four days later and tell them to start shooting. Um, and unfortunately, Rockefeller didn't do that, but that, that was what they were wanting him to come and see. The liberal Republican governor uh, was revealed to be uh, in cahoots with Nixon. You know, that, that was good that you got all that. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that that's one of the, the surprising things, you know, in, in the film that not only did, did uh, Rockefeller and Nixon talk on the phone afterwards, but they were talking on the phone before the retaking and Nixon was in Rockefeller's ear telling him, you know, uh, don't go in, don't, don't, don't do this. And that Rockefeller, Feller, you know, had political ambitions. You know, he was thought of as as kind of, you know, the the middle middle of the road Republican. Uh, you know, I I heard a report t yesterday about, about you know um, Rockefeller Republicans. You know, and that, that's still a term. Um, and and they were thought to be, you know, he was thought to be kind of the liberal wing. And um, but he wanted to be president. And 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 the law and order. Uh, Law and Order was ruling the day. That that's the, what Nixon ran on, and that was the the Republican Party at that point. And so, in, 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 to to realize his political ambitions, he, you know, he he had to be tough on crime, and 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 to be tough on crime, and, and Law and Order guy, you know, he he made the choice not to to show concern and not to go go into Attica, and, and um, you know, it was a devastating uh, choice. So those reforms that they were so idealistically uh, fighting for really never took place. The prisons are still not where they should be in, in today's day and age. Yeah, there were a few short-term, you know, cosmetic things that happened in the immediate aftermath. But um, a few years ago, the New York Times actually did um, a report where they went back and reviewed the list of demands um, that the prisoners had come up with those 30 demands and found that all of them were either implemented and then rolled back or never implemented at all. Yeah, I mean, and I, I think that's also any, any uh, you know, small demands that, that were met have to be balanced by the fact that, you know, there's over 2 million people in prisons today. So, you know, the, the, the prison population has exploded uh, in, in, in the years since Attica. That's right. Well, thank you again for this extraordinary piece of work, uh, both of you, and um, I'm glad I saw it. Um, I hope I hope you end up uh, doing well uh, as as you go forward. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much.